right, thank you. Um, glad to be here, by the way. I really enjoy these uh, conversations and, and also the presentations. I really was um, struck by this, the talk on intergenerational collaboration and how much we need that. Um, I'm an engineer, work in technology all my career. I'm on the older end of the spectrum here, as I think uh, was, was mentioned earlier, but the wide age range here. And uh, in my career, though, work with engineers, obviously at uh, all different ages and, and um, um, down to the 20s, not down below that. But it's, it's really um, struck me how it would be important to start making connections <clears throat> with age groups beyond, you know, below the, the kind of professional age range and down into the educational side. So um, maybe this will be the start of something like that for, for what we're doing um, where I work. Um, I also was struck by this comment said of boredom and creativity. I think that uh, actually is really important as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really, really like concerning what's happening right now as far as the, the times we're in and the way technology is kind of propagating so early into people's lives the way it is. I don't know if I can do a, um, a deck here, um, Steve, if I can't, it's fine. I've, I didn't unfortunately check in with you earlier, but I've got a very ugly presentation anyway that I Oh, there it is. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. So this is a, whoops, I says, oh, permissions. Never mind. It's a permission issue. I, I will, I'll just talk it because it's a really ugly, ugly uh, slideshow anyway that um, looks like an engineer made it. And I'll just give you a, kind of the, the rundown of what I've been talking about recently in, in technology circles, but I um, appreciate the opportunity to do it here in a, a broader, broader circle. And that is that, you know, um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone, I guess, that, to say that we're we're in a crisis. If you look at this time in history um, and there's a quote that uh, it's a roadie, Steve Parrish. Many of you probably don't know about this guy. Um, he's a roadie for uh, the Grateful Dead back in the 70s. And whenever they had a, a, um, like law enforcement people come in with challenges or issues they're having with their concerts, they would say, who's in charge? And his answer would be, the situation's in charge. <laughs> you know? And I feel like that's really where we are today. The situation is so complex with <clears throat> what's happening with social media, the propagation of disinformation and polarization that there's no one person in charge. We talk about big tech and there is an oligarchy there and a smaller group that's driving a lot of the, the, um, a lot of the issues that we're seeing systemically. But ultimately, no one, no one person or government is in charge of reining them in. And that, that's what's challenging for us. Um, in our case, in my case, as an engineer, started seeing this problem. Really, the, the signs of it, um, for me, started to become evident back around 2008. So, you know, over, over a decade ago, um, we, we were building my first startup that I started. We built a social network. And... We had really good intentions. We thought we we're going to democratize access to media on mobile phones because we had already seen in the early 2000s the rise of the very early signs that the mobile internet would be pervasive, which it clearly is today. And at that time, the carriers, the telcos, you know, uh, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, they controlled the mobile internet, and you had to actually go through them to have any content discoverable at the time. So we started a company to democratize access to content and it was a social network video on a phone. Um, we were early because that was before the iPhone existed. So the world was not ready for video at scale, but we did have about 20 million or so uh, people on the network worldwide completely overwhelmed us, but with uh, all the different behaviors, good and bad, but a lot of bad behavior when you have video um, without moderation. And so, so we, quickly realized we were not going to be able to control that at the scale we already were at that time. These are the days before we had, you know, social media at scale. And so we pivoted to become an analytics company and thought, well, we'll just provide analytics for other social networks because that's our, we're, our strength is in engineering. And that gave us a front row seat to uh, watch all this stuff unfold starting in 2008. And by that time, Twitter had launched and uh, we all know what's going on with Twitter today. Um, Twitter launched and was taking off rapidly. First adoption was among tech community. Facebook was also rising rapidly. And, and uh, we started 
processing, we're one of a few startups that process the full Twitter firehose. And what, what became clear over those few years there at the end of the aughts was one, this, the, the scaffolding, all the, the relationships between all the humans that would get online and connect with each other, those, those, are, those are really um, created by the people and that, that information should be for the people. And so what I, what I saw is it felt like you're watching virtual bridges being built, but they're privately owned. And, and we all know, you know, regardless of your political beliefs, there are some structures and some things in the world that, that don't work well when they're privatized. Um, we know that nobody's debating we should privatize the military and we, we rarely privatize, you know, scaled bridges and highway systems. Those are things that work well as public infrastructure for the benefit of everyone with equal access. And so that was what we started seeing. And there was a talk at the time about uh, the need for protocols versus platforms. And that kind of thinking went into my, my brain, I guess, back then and I started thinking about it uh, for years, how can we do that? And um, there were some technical limitations that I won't get into details, but for, for years, I didn't see a way forward. But um, around 2014, um, I, did, I started learning about Ethereum and Ethereum has got a lot of issues. The way it's used definitely is concerning, but started realizing that there was a way to create a, a, a universal database that's not owned by a private company or controlled by a state or any, any one actor. It, it can be decentralized the way that the internet itself is decentralized. And it's important to note that when you think about all the problems we're having with social media, um, it's important to think about why we have these problems, right? And, and it's people have said this earlier in talks, the companies, the private companies that run these platforms, they need to make money. To make money, they need more engagement for advertisers to drive engagement they have these algorithms that try to incite uh, people to check their phones more often, check the apps more often. What works best tends to be these emotionally engaging pieces of content that drive a polarization politically that in many cases are based on or tied to disinformation and inflammatory rhetoric. And that's that's the problem, right? So, so how do you unwind that? Um, technology alone won't solve it, but one thing that's clear to me anyway is that to unwind it, you have to find a way that our core way of communicating is not um, managed through these platforms with these incentives to drive drive you know profits through this engagement. That's that's a clear problem. And so when you think about well, how do we do that? Well, that's where you think about the public infrastructure and these protocols. Um, for the internet and the web, we have protocols that are public. You've probably heard of them. The hypertext transfer protocol for the web, built on top of TCP/IP, uh, which is the core protocols for the internet. And those are protocols that nobody owns and no, no one group controls. They're, they're governed by, the, by a, a large international governing body. And um, the issue is those protocols are for data in, in motion, when data moves around. But when data gets stored in a database, that's where things break down. And when you think about what we call Web2, which is social media, your profiles, your, your feed, all your posts, that, that all needs a database. They, they can't just move around. It has to be stored somewhere. And that's why we have these platforms. And so what we, what we realized in 2014 was that these blockchain databases are new decentralized databases that could be used for this purpose. And what we've seen is they've been mainly used for, you know, building wealth creation for early adopters around DeFi and NFTs. But that's a very particular case a use case that is not really what these things were necessarily built to do. So I just wanted to highlight, I've been trying to explain to people um, uh, what we're doing because I wanted to, to share that there's a way forward here that's that I think is really important for the way that we use technology. Um, and, and a big part of it is looking at this underlying technology for decentralizing the data we have. So three pieces to it. Uh, the technology. One is data should be by the people, should be for the people. And that, that means we should be using protocols. Number two, we need truth at scale to establish trust at scale. We're a globally connected society. So we do need a way to know what is real and what isn't. And that is a unique property of blockchains as they allow for uniquely signed digital assets that can't be changed. And that allows you to say this, this is a truly you know, this, this piece of information is, is true or it was truly created by this particular person. 
Um, and then finally, we need, though, and this is kind of one of the problems with current use of blockchain, we need a way to mitigate the risk of economic capture, what we saw with social networks here in the last decade um, with Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And blockchains typically have tokens and so forth. So what we've been developing is a protocol that does not have a token that leverages blockchains um, at lots of different blockchains versus one blockchain. So it's not built to create wealth for any one particular group. So we think that's really, really critical. We call that the decentralized social networking protocol. And you can read about it at dsmp.org. There's an article there that talks about that technology. Now, I want to pause there on the technology front because, you know, we have a saying that internally, a hammer, a tool can be used to build a house. It can be also be used to kill somebody. So technology tools alone don't solve problems, right? They can be used by people to solve problems. They can also be used by people to create problems. So what we just we decided to do early on with the development of, a, of the protocol was to start actually not with tech, but with values. And so we actually started working with the Georgetown Ethics Lab and Matt Maggie Little runs that lab. She's brilliant. Her team is brilliant. And we started working with them to create a values-driven development process so that we could set an example for building software uh, with a, starting with values versus starting with what's a use case that can drive engagement to drive profits. doesn't mean that we don't want to be economically sustainable, but it means that we want to be values-driven first. And throughout human history, you can see moments in time, including the founding of you know, the United States where values were at the front and center of the design process. So we wanted to bring that back. Um, and then as far as sustainability, we've looked at three axes of sustainability in our values. One is economic sustainability, of course, we have to have that. A second one is, is environmental sustainability. There's been a lot of talk about blockchain and the use of um, resources. And so, you know, we, we knew that we had to support more um, energy efficient uh, consensus mechanisms like proof of stake, not proof of work that Bitcoin uses, et cetera. So environmental sustainability, very critical. And finally, cultural sustainability. How do you build technologies that, that don't accelerate the demise of our culture? Um, we're very concerned about, you know, AI in the future and how that could affect our culture. But right now, before we even solve that problem, we feel like we need to solve the problem of how our internet works for or against us today. And that's why we focus on this particular uh, protocol. Um, so values driven development is very important. We've um, got a white paper we'll be publishing on that shortly that we worked on with the Georgetown Ethics Lab. We're expanding the universities that are involved with helping us work on this. It'll be open source and encourage you all to read that. Then on top of that is the actual protocol I mentioned that we've been developing, um, DSMP. And then finally, to make DSMP a reality, we've got to build actual blockchains. And we just launched our first blockchain uh, last night. It's called Frequency. Um, and if you go to frequency.xyz, you can read about that. And it's just one, one um, implementation of DSMP. There could be, be others, but, but it's important to start not just you know, speculating about how to change things. We think it's important to start building the change because like I mentioned earlier, we're in a crisis now. We need to work our way through it. So we're, we're now um, deploying that technology. We're trying to work to build a movement around that technology and a governance model. And those three tracks are part of a larger nonprofit effort called Project Liberty. So I'd encourage you all to look at, look at uh, you can go to projectliberty.org um, or projectliberty.io and uh, learn about, about that project. And it's basically looking at those intersections of technology, culture and governance and how do we basically build a better internet uh, by bringing those those elements together and just wanted to kind of spread the news that this effort's happening now i've learned a lot today about other organizations and other many working on this problem from other angles the uh, getmediasavvy.org i know is a place now i've learned about that we should be talking as well about how to work together um, there's a better internet coalition that's been emerging that we, we're working with or talking to about working together. So there's a lot of efforts right now happening, but I think it's really important that we um, move quickly to action to confront these acute problems we're seeing um, that are not just online, but they're happening now. We saw it with the election of 2016, the current election. We've obviously did better than expected, but still seeing challenges in Arizona right now. We're seeing 
issues with war crimes in Ukraine and how they're being portrayed. This is a real urgent crisis. So we need we need solutions now. So I encourage all of you to to learn about what we're doing um, and hopefully join join us in any way that you can. I think there's opportunities for all ages to be to be involved. Thank you.